Hi, this is Shotgun Tom Kelly, and now that I have your attention, you wanted to be close to him in the dugout during his impressive 15-year Major League career because he was always watching, listening, and looking for an edge. Now, Kurt Bavakwa brings that edge to Dirty Kurt's dugout, where you can listen, watch, and be a part of the most honest, informative baseball show available today. Now, here's Kurt. Hey everyone, how are you? And welcome today. Welcome to Dirty Kurt's Dugout. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this show, uh, and I'll I'll tell you why. We're going to talk a lot about what's going on in New York with the collective bargaining agreement, or what's not not going on in New York um, because the players still haven't gone back to uh, the owners with any kind of counter proposal on what the, the BS that they came up with last week. Uh, I mean, it's a whole week. It's been a full week since the players got this proposal, somewhat of a proposal, a starting point, something is Rob Manfred called it, to start with, I, I'm going to hate to sit back and watch these guys playing games back and forth right along with you. And that's the reason that I'm all for fans boycotting a game this year. I think it would work out. So we're going to talk about the, uh, the Hall of Fame vote that's coming up in, uh, well, the votes are in the Hall of Fame announcement that's going to be coming up in five days from today uh, on MLB Network. Finally, a live show instead of reruns, which they've been on since the lockout. And uh, But I want to talk about the collective bargaining agreement and, uh, you know, kind of what happened last Thursday and uh, what the owners threw out at the players and, and the players just, uh, you know, wanted nothing to do with it. The, uh, you know, the, the union, um, one of the things um, that the union fully accepted, or I should say the Players Association fully accepted and the union, what the unions offer was pension benefits. So, Everybody seemed like they wrapped their arms around that. And I heard yesterday that it's been pulled off the table. Which brings me to today's guest. Because I really wonder about what that's all about. And whether or not it was just pulled out of the fray because they agreed on it. Or whether or not it was literally pulled back off the table by the Players Association because of the way the owners went about the first offer. Doug Gladstone's a freelance journalist, uh, been writing for many, many years. He's the author of a book called A Bitter Cup of Coffee, how MLB and the Players Association threw uh, it, the number out there is 874. I think that number's a little different. I mean, it certainly is now. 874 retirees or alumni, uh, guys that I played with and against uh, for a long period of time, a curveball. Uh, and let me explain to you real quick while we wait for Doug to join us is the... Um, what took place back in 1980? The entire pension system for Major League Baseball was changed uh, back in the collective bargaining agreements in 1980. And the owners really threw something at the Players Association that they just couldn't refuse and they were falling all over themselves to make, to accept it as a matter of fact. And 
pre-1980, going all the way back to 1947, you had to have a minimum of four years of service. It was five going back to 1947 for a number of years, and that was all altered. Uh, and they made it four. So you you had to have a minimum of four years and a maximum of 20 to earn a major league pension. So in other words, if you got four years in the big leagues, like I did in the early mid seventies, I was on the clock. So every year that I got after that, it just kind of added on to the pension benefit that I was going to be awarded and was awarded uh, as a player at the major league level. Well, that four years to 20 years got blown out of the water. And the owners came to the Players Association in 1980 during their basic agreement said, I'll tell you what, as part of our agreement, because there were a lot of changes being made then, we're going to do away with the 20 years and make it a maximum of 10. And a player only has to have 43 days in the big leagues. Well, based on what I just told you, you would be doing the same thing that the owner, that the players association did at that time. And they fell all over themselves to say yes. Well, Doug Gladstone is going to tell us about the people that were forgotten in that negotiation because I can't I can't believe that Marvin Miller, who was uh, the lead and head of the Players Association at that time, along with Don Fear, would just ignore these players. And I was under the uh, the belief that the players were uh, were total uh, 1,200. But uh, Doug Gladstone is here right now. I want to welcome him to Dirty Kurtz Dugout. I also want to thank our sponsors, Hacienda Casablanca, and also uh, the good folks at La Cima Oil, uh, where we'll be giving away this $100 gift card to some lucky uh, listener and viewer out there who uh, gets our little quiz right. Uh, and before Doug comes on, we might pull our trivia question out of what Doug says. So listen carefully. And if in the next show or two, you're the first one to call in and tell us what the answer is, we're going to award you with $100 gift card. That's not bad in today's day and age with the cost of gas. So Doug, welcome. How are you? Hey, Kurt, I'm fine. Thank you very kindly for having me on the show. Can I participate? Uh, can I try winning the gift card? Absolutely. Keep watching the show. You can get in, too. We gave our first card to a viewer in uh, in Detroit. So it was it was kind of cool. So so do me a favor. I kind of set the stage for you with um, everything going in 1980 from four years to 20 years. Uh, all the way down from 43 days to uh, to just 10 years. So they cut the service time in half at the maximum. But what happened at that time? Will you explain this to the people that are out there? Well, essentially, um, as, I, as I know you know, and a lot of your listeners probably do as well, um, in 1980, the service credit that you needed for eligibility for a pension was four years. At that point in time, um, the players gave a May 23rd strike vote, and the hot button issue was the direct compensation to teams um, to compensate them for free agency. Well, uh, they, they didn't go out on strike during spring training. I don't know why. Um, so I, I imagine for maximum uh, effect, they waited to the Memorial Day weekend. You know, essentially the Memorial Day weekend is uh, one quarter of the season already played. 
And the, um, the negotiator for the league, the late air traffic controller, Ray Greeby, goes to the late Marvin Miller and Don Fear, and he says, look, if you call off this strike, we're going to make you your, your rank and file an, uh, an offer they can't refuse. And the offer was very, very good. I mean, it's a sweetheart deal. And it's been that way ever since. Uh, instead of four years, all you'll need um, is 43 game days to be eligible for a pension. And all you need to buy into the uh, health insurance plan is one game day. So essentially, you could be a call up on August 15th. And it's, it's been like this ever since for the last 42 years. You could be a call up on August 15th and, you know, just ride the pines. You don't have to take a glove out to the field. You don't have to come up to the plate. You don't have to pinch run. Uh, just ride the pines for 43 game days and you're going to get a pension. It's not going to be a big pension um, because you still have to factor in final average salary, uh, years of service. But you're going to get a pension at the age of 62 that is approximately worth, uh, according to the MLBPA, $4,000. Now, that's a, year. a phenomenal deal. $4,000 a year. I want to correct? acknowledge that, Kurt. Here's the problem. Um, the problem is that neither Marvin Miller nor Don Fear went to Ray Greeby and said, hey, you know, um, a lot of these guys have more than 43 game days, but they have less than four years. Can we retroactively restore them into pension coverage so they can be part of that deal too? No. They never went to Ray Greeby. Um, you know, Marvin on Veterans Day in November 2009 told me if I had to do it all over again, of course I would have, you know, requested that. It, it just slipped through the cracks. Nobody remembered to do that. So we fast forward to... Um, April 2011, at the time that Memorial Day weekend deal was struck, there were about 1,400 men. Uh, April 2011, they were, depending upon who you believe, either me, I said 874, the league says 905, um, the late Michael Weiner uh, went to then Commissioner Bud Selig and said, look, let's do something nice for these guys. Yes, they they didn't invest, but let's give them something. And, and the something that they've gotten is that for every 43 game days they were on a roster, they got $625 up to a maximum of... $10,000 a year. It's a one-time payment every February. It's better than nothing, but when the man dies, his widow, his loved one, his kid, his designated beneficiary, that money passes with the man. Um, and truthfully, you know, people were so elated to just get anything after 31 years that they didn't realize the implications of what they were agreeing to. Uh, a lot of them were very happy, but, you know, there are men, David Clyde, for example, the 1973 first round pick in the amateur draft. He's got four kids and two grandchildren. Uh, Carmen Fanzone, who played with the Cubs and uh, the Boston Red Sox. He's got a wife, Sue Rainey Fanzo. A lot of men on the Padres. Bill Dillman. Bill Dillman's son, Doug Dillman, follows me on Facebook. And Bill Dillman, you know, is now in Cocoa Beach, Florida. And all he's getting is this bone that's being thrown at them. And my 
principal beef is that here you have Tony Clark, the first former player um, ever to be at the head of the uh, the MLBPA. A man who, you know, if anyone knows how difficult the game of baseball is, it would be him. The man's not doing anything to help some of the men who grew the game. These were the guys, these old timers were the guys who went out on strike, endured labor stoppages. Um, also, that free agency could be ushered in. And it is my contention that Tony Clark and his liaison to the pension um, topic, Steve Rogers, the former great Montreal Expos hurler, just never tell the current player reps about this. And I've long suspected that, as you well know. And this week... I had, and he'll, you know, I'd love to break his name on the podcast, um, but because I made him a promise, I'm not going to do that. One of the members of the eight-person union executive committee found, finally was told by me that this is what's happening. Um, This is a man who's making a lot of money, has recently signed a very lucrative contract and he knew nothing about this. It really bore out what I've been suggesting all along. Tony Clark, Steve Rogers, Bruce Meyer, they are not telling current player reps about this travesty. About so are, this you blaming, are you blaming the MLBPA for this? What's going on with these guys that in my view, they should. There should have been some sort of retroactive number of players that going forward, if they had forty-three days, they should have been put in the same group. Because I, you know, I've got a question that I want to ask you later about that. But as far as pointing the finger, is the is the blame pointed to multiple areas, or is do you just put the blame on one person? Or one group. I'm I'm going to put the blame, not jointly, but because let's face it, if if Major League Baseball wanted to remedy this, Major League Baseball could. I don't know how many of your listeners know that unilaterally in 1997, pardon me, 1996, uh, no, it was 97, uh, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Jackie Robinson uh, breaking the color barrier. Um, Veterans of the Negro Leagues got up to $10,000. Men who played prior to the establishment of the pension fund in 1947, they got $10,000. As recently as August 29th of 2017, the 30 um, major league owners combined to write a $10 million check to the Hall of Fame. Now, look, I, I love the Hall of Fame uh, as much as anyone, but essentially um, you're putting relics ahead of real-life retirees. Uh, that $10 million could have paid for a lot of things, a lot of good things to all of these men. Uh, and, and again, Hall of Fame deserves an endowment. A whole, the Hall of Fame deserves the money, but so do these guys. Um, so Major League Baseball could remedy the situation, Kurt. Uh, the thing is, they are under no legal obligation to broach this in collective bargaining. They don't have to negotiate about negotiate this at all unless the union broaches it first. That's why I put the emphasis, if something's going to happen, it's got to happen with the union. Also, I, I just want to say, you know, I'm, I'm not a labor economist, but I do know that 
um, a union executive director's first responsibility is to his current rank and file. I get that. Uh, but I also believe, you know, you're going to be a retired member of the union way longer than you spend or you spent uh, in the big leagues. And oh, yeah. since unions do not have to give you the duty of fair representation, i.e. they don't have to legally advocate for you, I really feel that the MLBPA is dropping the ball here. These were the men, the Steve Grillies, the Chuck Scriveners, the John Wardens, uh, hell, the Pat Darcy's of the world. Everyone remembers Pat Darcy because he threw the uh, infamous pitch to Carlton Fisk in game six of the 75 World Series. Um, all of these men walked the picket lines so that today's current ball player can average $3.7 million dollars so that the 25th man riding the pines can make $575,000. You know what Carmen Fanzone made in his best year, Kurt? 32.5. Yeah, that's uh, that's something we can mull over. And the salaries are one thing, but what they could do to rectify uh, the situation here, especially, and you came up with, uh, I think, the year, was the first year of the first strike of the players' union. And that was in 1972. Any of these players that played before or after 1972, and it crossed over, they crossed that line and actually went out on strike to give us better things and to get the Players Association on the board as far as the, uh, the owners were concerned. I think... I don't know how many players that is. And I'm cer I certainly don't want to leave out the guys before 1972 because I think they're just as valuable as anybody else. But I think especially when the association was formed and we, we went out on strike for the first time in 1972, it should have been the cutoff. And just to recap quickly uh, what Doug – uh, Gladstone is talking about here, who's the author of uh, A Bitter Cup of Coffee, has championed uh, these, unfortunately, the number of players left uh, now, Doug, I think are only 525. Am I correct there? That is correct there. Well, so if that number started at 12 or 1400, it, it really doesn't matter. The fact that these guys are dying off at an alarming rate and they're leaving behind uh, spouses and families that a guy that you, whose name hasn't been brought up yet by the name of Dave Hilton, who I'm very familiar with, uh, his wife, Patty, um, and her grandkids live out in the Phoenix area. Dave, unfortunately, passed away a few years ago. And this really gnaws at me. And, and I'll tell you, not only you, I think you and I have might have discussed it before, but uh, the fact that Dave Hilton is about a month or a month and a half shy of being a fully vested player, or in other words, he's got three years. He played here in San Diego for a couple of years, uh, and then he went on and uh, started living in Phoenix full time, continued to coach, and was even, this is what blows me away, was a major league coach with the Milwaukee Brewers for two years in which he did not receive one day of service time to put towards his major league pension to put him over the four-year barrier. That blew me away. And that's when I really started to look into this thing. Uh, when I first heard of you, uh, when I first heard of the plight of these guys, uh, I never knew. I mean, Gene Locklear and I were, uh, played golf every, every week and every couple of weeks out here, he's a member of that group. I never even knew that until all these situations came about and I started looking into it on the shows and thing like that. You mentioned Pat Darcy. He's living down in the Tucson area, the guy with the Cincinnati Reds who, you know, I just, uh, Pat and I were, were kind of minor league 
uh, peers in the Reds organization when I was coming up through the Reds system. Uh, I never knew about Pat Dor Darcy. I didn't know he was uh, a few days shy of having a full-blown pension uh, or being a pension carrying card member of the Major League Baseball Players Benefit Plan. I hear these guys say now, and this is what really bugs me, is the pride involved. So it, it only leads me to believe that these guys are walking around and as high as they should be holding their heads, they're not because they're not, they don't feel like they're looked upon by what they left as being alumni. You know, sure, they were thrown a bone. And incidentally, so everybody realizes, and I'm going to get into the CBA after, uh, after Doug leaves us, but in this collective bargaining agreement, they are making as part of the deal, or they should be making as part of the deal to continue these payments to these players for the next five years, because this happened in 2011, like you said, they started getting paid on a yearly basis, not a monthly basis like we do. They got paid on a yearly basis, and you, you were correct in saying in February, and they're in limbo right now. They don't know when they're going to get their money. And you, you threw out a few names naturally. There's guys that have done well for themselves. And just like with the real in the real world, there's probably guys out there that are struggling a little bit and look forward to getting that payment every year, but they're not going to get it because of the collective bargaining agreement and the holdup of it right now. So the man you're looking at right now has championed these guys for a long, long time. I mean, he stayed at it. Uh, I think he's made some enemies along the way, <laughs> but he's made people stand up and, and take notice that, uh, that this is an issue that needs to be rectified. Uh, it needs to be looked at. And you know what? There's nobody that's going to stand up for these guys if their former peers don't do it for them. It doesn't look like the ones that are heading the MLBPA or anybody that works for Major League Baseball, unless you get some type of uh, a response uh, from – this gentleman that just became part of the executive committee, uh, it would be nice if he goes to the meeting and says, you know what, I just found out about this and this is terrible. We need to do something about this. And he starts uh, some, type of, some type of a crusade to get it going and get the ball rolling on it. But I think it's going to take more than that, Doug. And, uh, you know, you know that I'm behind it. I would like to see um, – these guys become fully vested. I mean, that's really the deal, I believe, in my mind. And I think it's theirs also. Well, you know, Kurt, you, you're, we've spoken about this um, privately. And while I would love nothing more than to have these men uh, fully vested, because it's legal, it can, it can be done. It, they can be retroactively restored. I'm pragmatic, conservatively. It would take about $90.2 million to restore the 525 men into pension coverage going back 42 years. And that's just giving them the bare minimum $4,000 that I alluded to at the outset of the show. How about I, I'm, I think we're both smart enough and your listeners are smart enough to realize that would break the game. And, and the real travesty is this. I'm just saying, give them what the Negro League veterans got in 1997 and 2003. Give them what the pre-1947 players got in 1997. We're only talking about $5.25 million. Uh, it's a lot of money to you and me and, and virtually all your listeners. But in the grand economy of the national pastime, it's chump change. And the fact that this union 
and I, I'm putting the bullseye directly on Bruce Meyer and Tony Clark and Steve Rogers. By the way, Steve Rogers uh, was the NL players rep back in 1980 who helped throw these men under the bus in the first place. He and Sal Banda um, for the AL. But the fact that Rogers and Clark and Meyer, the three wise men, or the three stooges, however you prefer, the fact that they can't or aren't willing to part with $5.25 million a year and I'm, I'm, you know, suggesting that when when the player passes on, the uh, the money continues for a finite period, like three to five years. That way, it won't be an economic hardship uh, for for any of the widows or kids. The fact that the brass at 12 East 49th Street, where the union is located, the fact that they don't want to do that, shame on them. It's reprehensible. That's what it is. I want to leave you with one quick story unless you have a question for me. Uh, Eddie Basinski, former Brooklyn Dodger infielder, um, he was the second oldest man uh, still alive. He passed away on January the 8th. He was among this ever-dwindling cohort. On the same day, a former Cleveland Indian and Milwaukee Brave outfielder, he was a pinch hitter extraordinaire, great fourth outfielder to carry on the team uh, named Don Dillard. Um, he passed away too. That kind of got lost in all the uh, news reports about Eddie Basinski. But Don Dillard, um, he contracted Alzheimer's and dementia a few years ago. And his wife of 60 years Elma told me the sorriest thing. I was practically in tears. Don forgot. He completely forgot that he had been in the show, that he had been a big leaguer, that he had played Major League Baseball. Can you imagine? Can you imagine forgetting all the joy that you brought fans of the national pastime? So my what I want to leave you and your audience your podcast listeners with is this. Please don't let the MLBPA forget these men. They've got to be remembered. They really have to. You know, when Jared Cole signed his 10-year contract with the New York Yankees, by the way, Jared Cole is also on the executive committee of the union. He said, I want to thank Kurt Flood and I want to thank Marvin Miller. Well, you know what? Words are cheap. You want to thank all the old timers who came before you? Put up or shut up and increase the bone that these men are getting before another Don DeLard passes on with, with thinking that MLB and the union had turned their back on him. Well, we're going to keep an eye on this, Doug. Um, I promise you, especially during... Uh, these negotiations, because this actually is going to have to be a part of these negotiations for these payments to go on. I, I can't imagine them stopping these payments. There'd be just too much backlash uh, to both Major League Baseball and uh, the Players Association. So I don't think that's going to happen. I'm kind of anxious to see if they're going to try to move it forward a little bit and possibly uh, be able to give these guys a little bit more. And that's, that's what, uh, what I'm looking forward to, but, you know, we'll keep in touch. I appreciate you coming on. Um, good luck with the book. Uh, keep us informed about anything else that you might be writing. Um, do you have a website or anything that people can go to, to find, uh, your, your journalistic reviews on things? Uh, you know, um, I took the website down actually a couple of years ago, but I am having, a piece this weekend about Don Dillard in the uh, Cleveland Plain Dealer, the largest paper in, in Cleveland. Um, and there's a book by, I don't know if, if you've ever had him on the show or he's ever interviewed you, 
a gentleman, a great author in Canada named uh, Danny Gallagher. Uh, oh, I know Danny, Danny just wrote a book, his most recent book. I think it's number nine. Um, includes a lot of interviews with the Don Boshes of the world and the Bullet, um, the Bullet Bob Reynolds of the world. All of these men played for the Montreal Expos, and uh, they're sadly, um, you know, totally forgotten by Steve Rogers, who uh, won 154 games with the Expos, but you know can't remember his teammates when when crunch time comes. So, thank you very kindly for having me on the show. I really appreciate um, the pub. Hey, and it's our just pleasure. You are stay safe and healthy, my friend. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on, Doug. All righty. Doug Gladstone, the author of A Bitter Cup of Coffee, about uh, the retirees that were kind of left holding the bag, for better use of terminology, um, after the 1980 uh, collective bargaining agreement negotiations in which the uh, amount of time that you needed to be a fully vested member uh, went from four years and maxed out at 20 to 43 days, maxing out at 10. Um, you know, one guy I saw on that list recently was a pitcher, a right-handed pitcher that pitched for the Yankees and I believe Baltimore by the name of Fred Bean. He's a guy that I crossed paths with uh, early on in my career. And, and I got to tell you, there's, I bet you a good half of the guys that are on this list. Um, I, I either played with or against at one time or another. Uh, Fred Bean is one of the guys that Doug Gladstone fights for. Or in other words, he's got a little less than four years in the big leagues. He's not fully vested and he doesn't get a major league pension, but he gets a payment because of what major league baseball did back in 2011, where they awarded these guys $625 for every quarter that they played in the big leagues. Now there's four quarters in each year of a major league season. So it's not like four quarters of our calendar year, but it's similar. So a 43 days compromises, uh, com comprises uh, one of the quarters. And let's say you played for one year and you had exactly uh, 42 times four, uh, your payment would be $2,500 a year. So they maxed it out at 10,000, which equals to uh, four years of four quarters a year. Naturally, a player doesn't get 10,000 or he would be a fully vested major league pension member, but he gets pretty close to it. So these guys that have like Gene Locklear, where he's only a, a month shy of being a fully vested pension uh card carrying member of the players association. Uh, his payment every year is probably $9,300 because he, he just missed by that one quarter. Uh, this stuff's going on. I, I, I started talking about Fred Bean. Fred Bean pay, played professional baseball in uniform from 1964 to 1979. Yeah, that's right. 15 years. If you look in the baseball register and you look up Fred Bean, it's going to tell you that he's got seven years in the big leagues. Well, parts of seven years, he appeared in a major league uniform. In all actuality, he has a little less than four years in the big leagues. I want to say hi to everybody that's been watching. Call your friends like I asked you guys to do last time. Because if you want to get serious, if fans want to speak out, they need to get serious about a suggestion that I'm going to make at the end of the show that I'll get to. But for everybody watching the show right now, 
send it out to your friends, especially if they're baseball fans, and see what they have to say about it. Fred Bean, 64 to 79, and didn't get his four years in. 15 years of being a professional baseball player. It's what the owners used to do to guys. I wonder how many guys that kind of started around 78, 79, or even 77, and got a few days in, got a full year in, and then 80 came. And because they were in the big leagues opening day of 1980 and played for a month and then never saw a major league uniform again, they're fully vested members, even though they don't have four years. But because they played after that threshold, the line was drawn in the sand. They're different than all these other guys. They shouldn't be. You know, we've got Bruce Meyer on the player side. We got Dan Hallam on the owner side. Uh, the union has proposed moving arbitration up a year, or in other words, from three to two, and raising league minimum salaries. Uh, the league proposed what they threw back at the Players Association, a complete overhaul of the arbitration system that would replace it with an algorithm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, analytics. For determining a player's salary based on production, but without the opportunity of the player to negotiate. So in other words, the numbers go in, they see what the player did, they throw the algorithm algorithm in there with the player's name, and they come out with an arbitration figure. No arbitrator anymore, no negotiation, which I'm sure doesn't make Scott Bor Boros and all the rest of the agents out there not very happy. So, you know, the union's been methodical about recovering uh, what it believes it's lost the last three years. And it's just not going to be able to do it in one year. I mean, the, the MLB and uh, Rob Manfred in particular has really beat the Players Association up. Uh, naturally, he's only held the reign for the last two. But he was the lead negotiator for Bud Selig before that. This guy's hardcore. He's going to make a stand. And he's got a way to do things where it makes him look like the good guy. There's a lot of people that really aren't that happy with him. As a matter of fact, there was a poll taken in the athletic that this was good because there were about 15,000 people that were polled. That's a lot of people. You know, that's a good number to get a pretty round robin effect from everybody out there. 62% of these people blame the owners. That kind of surprised me. Yeah, I was, you know, they're baseball people. They probably know what they're looking at and know what they're seeing. 92% of y'all expect the lockout will cause spring training to be shortened or canceled. But only 52% thought the season would be shortened. 85% of you said you're not that confident or not at all confident in Rob Manfred as commissioner. And the question that was asked, what issue would you most like to see addressed the most? You know what the answer was? 
So it just goes to prove we all have a lot to learn. It was broadcast blackout. So in other words, you care about watching the games at home. And that was the number one concern for you. But what you don't realize is that's not a CBA item. Or it's not a bargained part of the collective bargaining agreement. It it takes MLBs and the right holders to the television uh, broadcast to fix that. It it's, doesn't have anything to do with the Players Association. Okay, so I mentioned that the Players Association pulled the pension and benefits that the owners have had embraced and said that they, they would accept it. Nobody knows what was in that part of the proposal, or we don't even realize whether or not that it was pulled off the table or it was just set aside because they know it was accepted. But I heard yesterday it was pulled back off the table. We might be messing with semantics here, but I know that Doug Gladstone's plight with all of those players is part of that, probably. So I'm hoping that everything works out good and it'll be back on the table. I know I'll give you an example of why I'm trying to point that out because like the DH, everybody's talking about the DH and it being in the negotiations. From what I understand, it's a done deal. So there's going to be a designated hitter universally in baseball. Does it make me happy? Not really, but I'll explain that in another show. And the union wanted to expand the playoffs to 12 games from, or teams, I'm sorry, not games, um, 12 teams from the now 10 that earn their right into the postseason. The uh, owners wanted 14. Um it's being speculated upon that 14 is going to be the number. So we've got the universal DH. We've got 14 teams that I think it's a done deal. So in five days, I mentioned it at the top of the show. We'll see what happens when the players association comes back with the counter offer to what the owners uh, sent to them. But there is talk out there that no one's going to be elected to the Hall of Fame this year. You know, that doesn't happen very often. As a matter of fact, uh, there's only been nine times in the history of the voting, 1937, I believe, where there wasn't anybody that was voted in. You know, I think the rights to vote for the Hall of Fame needs to be looked at. Uh, I think the voting process needs to be looked at uh, by people a lot smarter than me. But when, when I see national writers that are publicizing the fact that they're sending in a blank ballot, uh, I, I just, I don't get it. I really don't. Uh, I mean, there's 40 players on these ballots. That, does there need to be 40? No, there really doesn't. And there's just 20 of them are obvious that it's, it's a done deal. You know, I mean, let's be real about things. Your name doesn't need to be, on, it's nice to be on the Hall of Fame ballot. Your name doesn't need to be on the Hall of Fame ballot. 100% of those guys have fully vested. Uh, they've earned uh, a star next to their name when it comes to baseball player. Um, the Hall of Fame vote and the Hall of Fame ballot 
should be for the elite group of people that played the game that were just heads above everybody else. I'm not talking about close. I'm not talking about comparing stats with the second basements from your era. The hell with that. I'm talking about being heads above these other guys. And then you get voted into the Hall of Fame. A guy like Bob Gibson. <laughs> but the last hit Bob Gibson ever gave up in the big leagues was a grand slam home run hit by a guy that was my roommate in Venezuela, Pete Lecoq. Pete is the son of game show host Peter Marshall. Great guy. But he had a grand slam home run off of Bob Gibson. And it was the last hit that Gibby ever gave up in the big leagues. A decade later, in an old timers game at Wrigley Field, Lecoq stepped to the plate, Bob Gibson was on the mound and he drilled him in the ribs. That's the way they played baseball. That's the way they played baseball back then. You know, one of my favorite times in the big leagues was as my dog walks through again, he, he, uh, he likes showing up in the show every now and then was the first time that I ever met Marvin Miller. Um, I was with Cincinnati Reds. It was my first major league camp and Marvin came in to talk to all the players and most of them uh, got an envelope. I had no idea what that was. Um, come to find out that it was a licensing revenue check. I knew nothing about it the licensing revenue check. But Marvin would come with his briefcase. Don Fair wasn't with him at that time, but in later years, he was all the time. Uh, it was just Marvin and Don. They brought one briefcase with them and they came to talk to the players about things that were coming up, things that they, we should be doing as a union. Um, of course, that first year we were talking about serious stuff. And that was going to battle with the owners over salary and free agency and the likes. And Marvin said something that I'll, I never forgot. And he said, guys, he goes, we're never going to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. But if that goose is fat and happy, we just want to make sure we get our fair share. I saw a quote by one of the bloggers today in one of the articles or yesterday that Major League Baseball and the Players Association are killing the goose that laid the golden egg. I had never seen that written between 1970 and now. And it brought me right back to that first spring training when I met Marvin Miller. And he made it a point to tell us that as a union, we weren't going to do anything to try to destroy the owners of baseball. Of course, it would be silly to do it. In the same breath, it's going to be silly of the owners to try to do anything to destroy the Players Association. Because that's where their bread is buttered. From the players. Even though they blacked out their faces and locked them out. Players that are getting medical attention, by the way, are still going to doctors. 
They're being sent to doctors by the team. I know we all thought when this thing first happened that all of these players that had Tommy John surgery or recovering from injury and this, that, and the other thing, they weren't able to get medical attention. Well, they're being spent, sent to doctors, and the teams are paying for it. Major League Baseball is paying for it. The reason they are is they're afraid of lawsuits. Now, if somebody just recently got hurt and they have to go to the doctor, it's a different story. But this thing needs to get settled. We all know that. We're all anxious for it to get settled. I know I want to make my reservations to go out to Arizona and watch some baseball games in the spring. I know you all do too. I know all of the people that live down in the Florida area want to go watch some baseball games in Florida. But it's important for all the baseball fans out there to let the owners and the players know how they feel. And I say, and I've said before on this show, that if there are games that are postponed or canceled because of a lockout or a strike this year, no matter what side you're on, you need to go down to your local park Not to go to the game, but to stand outside the game with a picket sign. You're going to get news crews down there. You're going to get the local and national media. Certainly, the people that are doing it at City Field in New York and Yankee Stadium in New York are going to get national news. And you're going to show everybody as fans that you mean what you say. Thanks again to Hacienda Casablanca. I'm hungry right now. Boy, I'd go for one of their Mexican dishes because they're good. Uh, They're out in El Cajon, California, 700 North Johnson uh, in El Cajon. Uh, As soon as we get ramped back up again, we're going to have some watch parties out there. Uh, Tell Tony and uh, and Cindy that KB sent you. Uh, I want to thank producer Joe. Let me see if Joe's still here. I know uh, he was having a little little problems technologically early on. There he is. So we we have, uh, I think next week we'll have, the question for everybody listening. And if, if you don't know what we're talking about, uh, I know we're going over a little bit here, but uh, Joe and I, mostly him, come up with a, a question for you uh, based on one of the last two or three or four shows, three shows. Uh, so we want to make sure you listen and Lasima Oil Company here in San Diego, your neighborhood Chevron dealers, are uh, are nice enough enough to give you, if you get the answer right, a hundred dollar gas card that you can just drive right up to Chevron Station, hopefully fill it up. Our first question, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, uh, Joe came up with the fact that when we had Jack McKeon on. Uh, Jack had pointed out that uh, now I can't even remember who there there was only one city that he really had trouble coaching in that uh, he was uncomfortable in. And uh, that was Oakland. No, that uh, wasn't a question for Jack. It was in regards to, it was in regards to the catcher. Rodriguez. Pudge. He um, so he benched. He hit the showers right in the middle of the game. Right, and and so uh, Jack got in his face in front of the team, and he had just became the manager of the Marlins. So making his mark, he made his mark. That's exactly right. And uh, he called Pudge out in front of the team, 
uh, that team came together and they ended up winning the World Series that year. And Pudge Rodriguez went to Jack at the end of the year and he said, I want to thank you. Uh, it made me a better player. Uh, it brought the team together. Uh, so that was the question. What player did Jack McKeon yeah. call out uh, when he became the, uh, the manager of the Miami Marlins to help them go on and win the World Series? And it, it was Pudge Rodriguez. So we're going to do that again next week. And uh, we'll let you know the time and date for that show. It'll either be Thursday or Friday of next week. And uh, I've got uh, requests into a couple of surprise guests that I'm not going to throw out any names yet. But I will be letting you know through uh, the Facebook Lives and, and some posts on social media if I can figure out what the hell happened to my Instagram account. So Kirk, I want to. Can I? Uh, do, do you mind if I throw in two things about Hacienda? Yeah, go right ahead. Hacienda, they really do have some big things coming. There's some great changes coming. Stay tuned. We will announce them here. Uh, mm -hmm. Really good stuff. It's a great restaurant, and it's only going to get better. The second thing is they're going to be having a special Valentine's Day dinner. So you got to make your reservations now. And let me tell you, that's a great meal, Valentine's. So bring someone and uh, have a great night at Hacienda. Yeah, they they came up with a great deal of thank a great meal of Thanksgiving. Yep, and it, very it different. Yeah, what they had their regular Mexican menu after I think f two or three in the afternoon, but before that, it was all turkey and stuffings and all of the good stuff. So I'm sure uh, Cindy and Tony are going to come up with something great for Thanksgiving. So thanks for watching. Uh, please pass the word to your friends. We want to see if we can get people behind this thing. And make it a reality. If nothing happens, then so be it. We all continue to be great fans. But if something doesn't happen, then I want you to leave your mark also. I want you to let the owners know. And I'm not talking about San Diego. I'm talking about across the United States. Every major league park. If anybody can do it, you can right here on social media. So until next week, this is Kurt Babakwell for Joe, the producer, and Alan, our technical guru. I will see you next time.